With that introduction, let us take up the reading of this psalm, Psalm 112. Please give your attention again to the reading of God's holy word. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. He hath dispersed. He hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Amen. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to another glorious text and quite a challenging one in many dimensions. And so we pray, Father, that you, even as you have done a good work in our hearing of the word, you would bless your minister who will now preach this word to your people. Father, we pray that your spirit, the spirit that inspired this text, would move the heart and mouth of the minister, that he would preach the truth and nothing but the truth. And we pray as well for the hearts that will receive this word preached, that they would better fear the Lord after hearing this word, and that they would better take delight in God. Father, no man can do these things. And so we ask and pray that the Spirit of Christ would rest on us all and that Christ would increase, that we, his people, may decrease. And so we pray that you would help me speak now, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have been on social media for any length of time, you have probably seen a particular hashtag, hashtag blessed. And the hashtag is often used because the person has received a temporal kind of blessing. Perhaps they had a great dinner or they went on a good vacation and they want to say hashtag blessed, which is really in a lot of ways more of a boasting in what they have done rather than truly what blessing is, which is a recognition that the hand of God has given me this that I must glorify God for what he has done. Instead, it sort of ends up being, let me show you what good things I have, uh, I have, and they don't give thanks to God. And even the unrighteous, right, they have a need to give glory to God because God is pleased to pour out his blessings on the just and the unjust alike, right? All should say when they receive their daily bread, hashtag blessed in effect. But personally, as we come into the psalm, I have never seen anyone use that hashtag in relation to the fear of God. Which is what our psalm proclaims, of course, that the blessed man, the happy man uh, or woman is he or she that fears the Lord. That such a man or woman will receive both gifts and graces, both in this life and ultimately the life that is to come. And that we must see that our blessedness is found, just like our wisdom begins with the fear of God. Our blessedness begins with the fear of God, and he greatly rewards those that would fear him. And we don't seem to recognize that. And so the psalm comes to challenge us, to show us that not only is the fear of the Lord the beginning of your wisdom, beloved, but it is also the root and source of every spiritual blessing. And so with that introduction, our theme is the blessedness of fearing the Lord. The blessedness of fearing the Lord. And we'll consider it under the three headings that you have on your outline. The first is the believer's reverence and delight. Second is the believer's marks of happiness. And third is the unbeliever's eternal misery. So first, the believer's reverence and delight. 
Now, there's not much, as we think on the background of this psalm, that can be gleaned about it. There's not much that you can tell, either from evidence internal or external. The author is not mentioned. There is no inspired title. And there, is no, there are no historical clues. But what is plain about the psalm is that it is to be paired with the prior psalm, Psalm 111. These two are coupled together. It is structured exactly like the prior psalm. It is an acrostic poem. And boys and girls, you might remember that from the last psalm that we considered last month, which is that every line of it in Hebrew, not in English, in Hebrew begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet successively. 22 lines then from uh, A to Z, so to speak. A comprehensive view then we are finding of the blessed man that fears the Lord. And what it is, is an exposition and expansion of the final verse of Psalm 111. You're probably there in your Bible, so just look up a verse in verse 10 of Psalm 111 that says what? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. So Psalm 112 expands on that verse to demonstrate that man's happiness is found in one place, the fear of Jehovah. As our first verse says, praise ye the Lord. Blessed is who? The man that feareth the Lord. That's the thesis of the psalm. That's the truth, not just the thesis, that all who fear the Lord are happy. And so what it is telling you as you sing praises to God is that the truly happy man or woman is the one who fears God. If you want blessedness, you must fear God. If you want true happiness, not the the shallow happiness of the world that is here today and gone tomorrow. True happiness is rooted and sourced in the fear of God. And what the rest of the psalm will demonstrate is that the fear of the Lord brings to a man or woman blessings, concrete blessings in domestical life and in their spiritual walk with the Lord. It brings blessings to a man or woman. It removes fear. It removes anxiety. It it removes a, a, a faith that is moored and rooted in circumstance. But in God himself, and their walk in this life is blessed as well in that. And in fact, what the testimony of the Bible is, is not only does the fear of the Lord give you great gifts, but also that the fear of the Lord itself is a gift from God. Isaiah 33, verse 6, the fear of the Lord is his treasure. In so many ways, beloved, the fear of God is commended to you. You are to treasure the fear of the Lord. I suppose the question would be, how many do? Do you yourself, do I fear the Lord? If you do fear God, what must you say? Oh, my soul, I have been given a great treasure from God that few have received, especially in our day and age. For out of it, oh, my soul, is the beginning of true wisdom. It serves as a testimony of grace. It serves as a testimony of glory of eternal life, the life to come, that God is my Father, that Christ himself is mine, and I will persevere to the end because I am rooted in Christ. And that's at the end of the day what the Bible teaches. The God-fearer is the one who is in Christ. There are no other God-fearers on the earth. Only those in Christ have the fear of God. Because if you truly feared God, you would flee to Jesus Christ for refuge. If you, don't, if you don't fear God, you don't flee to Christ. That's really as plain as it gets. Otherwise, what Romans 3 says is there is no fear of God before their eyes. So beloved, you have to see it this way. The fear of God is a gift from God deposited in the heart by the Holy Spirit And it testifies that you trust in Jesus and not yourself or any other man or person for refuge, for salvation. And our psalm calls you to praise the Lord if you possess it. 
which is why it begins with praise ye the Lord. As you heard last Lord's Day, or last month rather, you heard that praise ye the Lord in Hebrew is what? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that word is to be put only in the lips of those that fear God. So what is the tenor of this fear? And it's good to remember these things we are prone to forget. What is the tenor of the fear, uh, which is the matter of the psalm's praise? For the Christian, it is not, it is not the fear that the wicked have of God in verse 10, which we will get to. Uh, those who will gnash their teeth in horror and grief when the wrath of the Lamb comes, saying to the mountains, let the mountains fall on us. That's not the kind of fear that the Christian has of God. And child of God, let me say, if you are in Christ, God does not call you to fear him that way. In fact, that would be wicked. He is your father, which art in heaven. And I think sometimes the problem comes because we import and impute to God the father what our earthly fathers have been to us, right? And I know from experience with some of you that you might have had a father who is more likely to give you a backhand across the cheek than to be benevolent to you. And you must not think of God and the fear of God in such terms. Because if you hear of the fear of God, you might be gripped with a certain kind of anxiety. But beloved, as we have sung even in the psalm book, the Lord, he pities the believer. He is a good father to you. What is Christ's, uh, you know, that's the psalm in the Old Testament, right? But what is Christ's picture that he paints of God the Father? A father full of compassion. The one who runs to embrace you, his prodigal, when you sin and you return to him. The father of the 103rd Psalm that pities us and has compassion on us. The father that sent his only begotten son into the world for you who believe. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3.17. He is the one that you heard of in the last communion service. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? This is God, the Father to us. So if you are in Christ, you do not fear God as the one who will smite you. But what this psalm teaches is happy is the son or daughter of God that fears him, meaning that reveres him, that reverences him. And that's what we must understand what the believer's true fear of God is. It is to reverence and respect him. Even as we are to reverence and respect our own fathers and mothers, right? As the fifth commandment, providentially, which was in our confession of sin. Leviticus 19.3 says, Ye shall fear, that is reverence, every man his mother and his father. That's what the fear of God is to the believer. It's to be in awe of God. It is to be aware of his majesty, of his glory, of his holy and heavenly radiance, of his might and his power, of his relationship to us. He is our creator. We did not make ourselves. If it was not for him, we would not exist. What is the fruit of such reverence? It will be an earnest desire to adore him, to submit ourselves to him, to please him, to not sin against him. And when he speaks, right, as the Lord our God speaks, we will be very careful to listen to every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God with care. And when he speaks, we would conform our lives to his instruction in the word of God. Or otherwise, could we say we fear God? And we would watch over our souls, lest we would displease him. We would live for holiness. And here's the thing, because we will sin. When we do sin, where does the God-fearer turn? Does he or she run away from the God that they fear? No, the God-fearer runs to God in Christ for grace and mercy to help in our time of need, knowing that our Father, as he is our Father, who is good and gracious and compassionate, is watching as the father of the prodigal does to come, wait for us to come back to him away from the slop of our sin. That is what the God-fearer knows, that God the Father is there to embrace us. And if he does chasten us for our sin and discipline us, 
We submit to it out of love, as Hebrews 12 says. Now, this cannot be a comprehensive sermon on the fear of God. So these are just some of the ways, just to give you a taste of what the fear of God is, and some of the ways in which the fear of God is manifest in the believer. And that theme is replete throughout the Scripture, not just the Old Testament. The problem is we come to the New Testament and we think that the fear of God is erased in Christ. Here's two examples. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, that is the promises of the gospel, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, what? Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Holiness is perfected how? By having the fear of God. Or Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. Your God is a consuming fire. You must have an awe and godly fear or reverence of a God who consumes. But the tension there and the glory is that in Christ, right, believers are like that burning bush. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, The bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. Isn't this the glory of it? Our God is a consuming fire and believers, right, who have the spirit of God dwelling in them are not consumed because of the work of Jesus Christ. Even so, wasn't Moses told that he stood before a holy and awesome God? Yes, and that's where our tension is. So each of you must ask this Lord's Day, how much do I fear God? How big is the Lord in my eyes? Am I bigger in my own conceit than God? Does God exist for my pleasure? Or do I exist for His pleasure? And I have to even ask, do I fear my Redeemer? Or has Jesus just sort of become my chum? Right, Sort of take Him or leave Him. He's there when I need grace and mercy. Otherwise, he's not there at all. Do you not know the glory of the Savior himself, God incarnate? Do you have the glory of Christ in your soul that you read of in Revelation 1? His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. He's a consuming fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, this is John speaking, I fell at his feet as though dead. He is glorious, this Jesus. He is utterly glorious and radiant. And yet, yet what is so wonderful, isn't it, is that with his glorious, radiant majesty, what did our mediator say to John straight away as he fell at his feet as though dead? He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not. Do you see that, how this all works together, beloved? Right? A consuming fire. You see that he's a consuming fire as as hints of his glory come into his eyes. And his radiance is is so much like the sun in its strength. And yet he can say, as the God-man, fear not. And this is that fulfillment, isn't it, of the bush that doesn't burn, that doesn't, isn't consumed rather, but burns with the presence of God, our Savior. In other words, the Savior says to you, I am a consuming fire, but as I have died for you, like the bush, like Moses, like John, you will never be consumed. You're not to quake with slavish fear, but you are to revere me. Isn't that where worship itself begins, beloved? With such an awe for God. You don't worship anything you don't have awe for. The the less your awe for God, the less likely you are to worship him. Well, One of the fruits of the fear of the Lord in verse 1, one of the graces in us will be a delight then to keep the Lord's commands. Verse 1, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord that delighteth greatly in his commandments. You see, one of the false dichotomies 
it, it, that comes to us is to think that the fear of the Lord and, his, and following his commandments banishes our joy and delight in the Lord. Absolutely false, utterly false. In fact, that is a devilish doctrine. Do you remember where that doctrine began? It began in the garden, friends. It began in the garden when Satan tempts Eve with that thought, right? God is keeping you away from blessedness and delight because you can't have this one fruit. His commandment would not be something to delight in. But if she only knew God, she would see that I would delight in this commandment because that commandment keeps me from death and misery. No, we are to make the commandments of the Lord our delight and not listen to the devil. The problem begins when we do not see his commandments as an expression of who God is. The commandments of God express God's will. And so if you delight in God, you would delight in his will. And you would therefore delight in his commandments. It's as simple as that. You would delight in what he wants then, wouldn't you? Isn't this why the Lord gave you a, a, a petition in the Lord's prayer? Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Meaning that God make me pliable and obedient to your commandments, your revealed will. Let me ask. Well, even our Savior, didn't he pray? And we are saved by this, right? Not my will, but thy will be done, right? That's how we are saved, because he did the will of God. Let me ask this then. If you truly delighted in God, if you say you love him, would you not want to follow his will? How can you love a God uh, when you don't love his will for you? It's clearly impossible. 1 John 5.3, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not what? Grievous. In other words, they're the opposite. They are delightful. Jesus said it very plainly, if you need it this way. If ye love me, keep my commandments in John 14, 15. Beloved, it is always the work of the flesh and it is the work of Satan and never the work of the spirit that causes you to despise and not delight in the commandments of God. And in this, even think of how, in view of all this in this first verse, think of how the Sabbath commandment that is often despised is framed. It is framed with delight. Isaiah 58, 13 through 14. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a what? Delight. The holy of the Lord honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways. See, fifth commandment is even seen there, right? Honor him. Not doing thine own ways, not finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou what? Delight thyself in the Lord. New Testament is the same way. What did Paul say in Romans chapter 7? For I delight in what? The law of God after the inward man. Now where we get confused is this. If salvation depended on our delighting in the commandments and keeping them, then we would be sunk, right? Because until we are perfected in glory, we will still stumble, even as Paul the Apostle did. How did he cry out after delighting in the law, but seeing that his flesh often broke it? O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our thanks to God and the blessedness that comes to us is that Jesus is both Lord and Christ, both lawgiver and forgiver. You and Christ are freely and fully forgiven. And that thought actually, rather than causing us to diminish the law of God, causes us to magnify our delight in the Lord and seek his will all the more. That's why he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you have loved all that I am to you, how can you not love my will as well? That also means that our praise in the psalm must rest on Christ. There can be no praise. There can only be condemnation for you without faith in Jesus Christ. You know, you are to praise the Lord for Jesus in the psalm. Who is it that we are singing of? Is it not Christ himself? He alone is the one who feared the Lord perfectly. And our delight in God's will will never be one iota of what Christ's was and which is what God demands, that kind of delight and obedience to his uh, will in order to be saved. 
Jesus is the man of the 40th Psalm. Listen to this. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I, what? Delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, my, thy law is within my heart. And Hebrews 10, which we will read next Lord's Day, cites that text as speaking of Jesus. And so our delight can only be in the one who delighted to follow all the laws of God. Our hope can only be in him to be saved. And his righteousness, I'll cover this later, is given to us who believe in view of it. So we praise the Lord that all the blessings that come to us come through the only man that ever feared God. Jesus Christ, Son of God, the Lord our righteousness, are standing before God. And only you who are united to him by faith receive the blessings of our text. So with that understanding then, let's consider our second head, the believer's mark of marks of happiness. What happiness does the God fear, the one in Christ, united to the one who has always feared the Lord, uh, receive? They are promised great blessings. And they can be cataloged as two kinds, gifts and graces. Gifts that are both temporal and eternal, but also spiritual graces that is, uh, a receiving of a Christ-like character. This catalog, from A to Z, so to speak, uh, of gifts and graces is the psalm's matter of praise. And as we walk through this text, I will divide these blessings into eight. And each is worthy of a sermon. You could have easily a sermon series on eight of these blessings that come to the, those who fear God. So I'm going to skim over the surface of the water, so to speak, today. And you might even think I'm not moving fast enough. But there's much here to consider. So the first of these eight blessings is that the God-fearer's posterity is blessed. Verse 2, his seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. By way of covenant, God has promised to be to us, a God to us and to our children after us. Even as we read from Acts chapter 2 last week, didn't we? Acts 2.39 For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so if you fear the Lord, you can plead this promise of the covenant for your children. The covenant of grace is not just to me, but my children as well. Exodus 20, in the covenant of grace, in in the Old Testament, in the second commandment you read, and God showing mercy unto thousands, meaning generations, of them that love me and keep my commandments. Do you love your children, brethren? Fear God, delight in God, and delight in the commandments of God and keep them. He says your seed shall be blessed. This is not a God to praise, a God that loves us and our children as well. Now, some of you might ask, and many do, How could this apply to those of us who never have children or never will have children? Maybe you are single or maybe infertility has kept the womb from being opened. Well, you can think of the same blessing that comes to many. This blessing is there as well. You think on the Apostle Paul, right? He had no physical children at all, but many spiritual children, didn't he? How did he speak of Timothy? And it's such a wonderful thing when you read of how he considers this man. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. John Calvin, you remember in our Calvin study, his children all died in infancy. But what did he say he was satisfied with when the Roman Catholics used that against him? He said he was satisfied that the Lord had given him many spiritual children. And he was happy in that. And so if you are single, you have the gift of singleness or you don't have children of your own, you can invest in the time you would give children to others, even to the lost. And you think on this, in glory, right, you will be embraced as father or mother to those that came to faith through you. And that's a wonderful thing. You think of the apostle, how many spiritual children have received him in glory? And if barren, you may also have the blessing of adopting children into your home, and this very promise applies to them. This is not just a promise to those who have physical seed out of their own body, but any that come into the covenant home have this promise attached. And isn't that a wonderful thing, right? Adoption itself represents the grace of God, 
which is our adoption into the family of God. And so we see in that the great blessing of God too. Now you might ask, what if my children walk away from the Lord? You know, I have in my own experience known some whose parents passed into glory thinking that their children were apostates. And they were at the time not in the Lord. But I have seen these same children come to the Lord after the death of parents. Or sometimes even more astonishing, and this really staggers the mind, grandchildren come to the Lord. And so though there might be a small small breach even in the covenant line, it is not finished. And the Lord brings those who are out of the same lineage to himself. Often the Lord tests our faith, beloved. And it might be that our immediate children do not come to the Lord, but generations afterward do. You have to only look at places with great apostasy that once had the the Reformation burning brightly, places like the Netherlands and places like Scotland itself. Do you believe, beloved, that the Lord is finished with the lineage of the faithful of the Reformation? Do you think he is done with their generations and that this promise then cannot apply? No, by faith, just as you expect it of the Jews, we ask with Paul in Romans 11, hath God cast away his people? What did he say? God forbid. We expect out of desolation, out of spiritual ashes, the Lord will usher in great revivals, just as he will one day call all the Jews to himself. And he tests you. Will you walk by faith in my promise or by sight? You need to believe, believer. Generations will arise from us, whether from our body or through our our labors, that will be blessed. And covenant children, let me just say, as you look on this promise, this astonishing thing in Psalm 112, you, the children of believers, see how privileged you are. You truly are. God delivered you into a home that holds forth Christ, I trust, day by day. You know of the living God. You know Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Your soul is prayed for daily. Your parents are filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise God. And if you think you should despise these things and instead run after the privileges of the worldly people who have a lot in this world, have you seen the children of the privileged in this world? How often these are driven to despair and depression. The wealth of The people of this world are just a facade, unable to save them. But you are truly blessed. And so be filled with gratitude to God that you came into a Christian God-fearing home. Second, God-fearers receive the blessing of provision. Wealth and riches, verse 3, wealth and riches shall be in his house and his righteousness endureth forever. Now, this must be taken in the manner intended by the Lord, interpreted with all the counsel of God. This does not mean that every believer, and you know that just even in the pages of Scripture, that every believer will be wealthy and rich as the world counts wealth and riches, materially speaking. You may well be. Their riches themselves are not an evil. It's the misuse of them. But even Jesus, the righteous one, never possessed earthly riches in this life. You know, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So take note of how wealth and righteousness are connected in our verse, and let that drive you to Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, meaning provision, shall be added unto you. What he's saying is, you seek first the righteousness of God, the kingdom of God, right, as first place in your life, and all that you need in your homes will be cared for. That's really what this text has in view. And you also need to then look past material things and remember that Jesus showed the believer to receive true riches, distinguished from material wealth. Luke sixteen eleven. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? What are true riches? Uh, this is another sermon in itself. Spiritual riches, right? A possession first and foremost of Jesus himself, which we will consider this afternoon in the Song of Solomon. My beloved is mine and I am his. But also graces from the Lord that fortify your soul and will make you fruitful, that will cause you to persevere. Communion with the Lord himself 
uh, communion with the one that says, My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment. Proverbs 8. These are the riches, right? The, the working of God in our heart, in our mind, to conform us to Christ. This fruit is better than gold. And it is such fruit then as we consider the third blessing that comes, which are spiritual graces. Verse 4, unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Now, I, I love this phrase here. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. Right? You remember what was the, the theme of the Reformation itself? After darkness, light. Right? Light coming from where? The word of God. Right? To the upright, there ariseth in the midst of any darkness, whether it's the darkness and despair of their own sin, whether it's the darkness of the world, whether it is the darkness that seems to cloud us in our circumstances, out of the word of God will always be light for the believer. The God-fearer has spiritual light revealed to them. They pray with their Bible open, Lord, give light. Give light in the darkness. And the Lord promises to give them light. Now, is that not a blessing itself? Isn't Jesus Christ himself the light that arises out of the darkness? Right? And from that light is given to them by the working of the Holy Ghost, these graces, graciousness, compassion, and righteous or good works, but also a graciousness. He is gracious. And you think of our Lord Jesus in this way, beloved, the man who feared God. How often have we read, even in Luke's gospel thus far, that the Bible shows him moved with what? Compassion. And the God-fearer is not a hard man or hard woman. They are a compassionate man. They are a compassionate woman. And that's what we have to see. They, the God-fearer has had their heart of stone replaced with a compassionate heart. And that's what we must cultivate, beloved. And out of that compassion are righteous acts, which is what the fourth mark of blessedness is, the grace of good works. This is manifest in different ways. The first is charitable giving. Verse 5a, a good man showeth favor and lendeth. Also, verse 9a, he hath dispersed and he hath given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. The God-fearer is a generous man. You heard it last week in the Macedonian example. The one that delights himself in the Lord is extraordinarily, sacrificially generous because freely they have received and freely they give in turn. They have received the gift of God, the pearl of great price that no man can earn. They have received Christ freely and freely they give to others with compassion. And even the giving, right? This is what we don't recognize. These are the blessings of fearing God. That even this generous heart is a blessing to us. Right? We heard last Lord's Day that the Lord Jesus has said, as Paul has cited him, it is more blessed to give than to receive. To spur then the God-fearer on in good works, which are also a gift from God. Verse 9 and also verse 3 says, His righteousness endureth forever. In this very short psalm, that is repeated twice for emphasis. Now, as Reformed Christians, we have to be careful as we handle this text. That righteousness cannot be the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. That righteousness that saves us as it is imputed to us. And part of our problem might be to always equate righteousness in the Bible with justifying righteousness. And we forget then and fall into the trap of the Roman Catholics. We forget that we are called to perform good works, not for salvation, but as the fruit of our salvation. Verse 3 and 9 show us that our righteousness is connected to good deeds. These righteous works, the Bible says, were prepared for us, and performed by us in Christ, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You might say unto righteous works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. 
And so the, the righteous man or woman must not neglect to do good works. Giving and doing good is a grace and the blessedness of the God-fearer. And you must, not, you must see it that way. It's not a bare duty, right? But rather it is a gift from God to be engaged in good works. It is a gift to us. Now, what does that repeated phrase, though, his righteousness endureth forever, mean? Well, two things, right? That the, the, the manner of life of the God-fearer is righteousness. The overall picture of your born-again life is not a testimony to wickedness, but of righteousness and of goodness. Second, and we've considered this in the book of Hebrews, and this astonished us as well, right? That the Lord will always remember the righteous deeds you have done in him. Hebrews 6.10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed towards his name and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And that thought may be more than any other, that my father's face shines and smiles upon me and will remember what beggarly things I have done out of faith for his name's sake. Though it was his grace, right, that came into my heart even to do it, even though he himself had prepared them for me, he remembers them uh, for my good and he also remembers them as though they are mine. And as for my evil, what has my good father promised? That my sins and iniquities will I remember no more. This is the goodness of God. I won't remember your evil, but I will remember what meager things you have done that were good in my name. It's astonishing. And as for your good deeds, be spurred on as well to do them, that your Father be glorified. Matthew 5, 16, this is what the God-fearer sees. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, what? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. If you fear God, right, you must care for the glory of God and you are to let Christ's light shine through you. And so you might ask, right, I have asked for light to arise out of the word of God how do I reflect that light I have received that I may glorify God before all men? The fifth blessing given, and I'll try to get through these a little quicker, is the grace to be just. Verse 5b, he will guide his affairs with discretion or justice. When the God-fearer does business, when he does his labors, he does it justly, fairly, and equitably. I remember reading Spurgeon on this and I was struck with a very keen insight that he had into unbelievers. He says that the unbeliever will mock the God-fearer for his religion, but when he wants to do business, who does he do business with? He does it with the God-fearer because he knows that such a man is going to be just in his ways. You see, there is in a small sense an understanding of the grace of God in the God-fearer. He may mock the man, he may mock the woman, but when it comes time to entrusting his riches, he will go to the God-fearer because the God-fearer guides his affairs with discretion and is unlikely to rip them off. Sixth, the sixth blessing that the God-fearer is given is steadfastness. Surely he shall not be moved forever. And in verse seven, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. He will ever reside on the Lord's side. He doesn't wander about. He knows his place and home is with God. And he is no fair weather friend of the Lord. If you truly revered God, you would be wherever the Lord is to be found. In his ordinances, in public worship, in the secret place, in Christian fellowship and communion and so on. His heart then will be fixed. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. He trusts in the Lord. He has given the grace to trust in the Lord, no matter his circumstance, right? This is a gift from God. When evil reports come, the God-fearer says, what of it? My God is sovereign. My God rules. Jesus Christ rules at God's right hand. And I will be steadfast, even as Stephen was steadfast, peering into heaven, seeing Christ at God's right hand. And I am unmoved. This is a grace that only the God-fearer has. Because if you feared God, what would you fear? Nothing. 
Nothing. This is the great gift of fearing God. Their heart is not shaken. They are fixed, rooted in place, stayed upon Christ. Verse 8, his heart is established. He shall not be afraid. Fear God and your heart will fear no man until he see his desire upon his enemies, right? You will fear no man, nor will you fear any providence. At Knox's graveside, one of his opponents, theological and ecclesiastical, Regent Morton famously said, right? This is an opponent of his. He said, here lies one that neither flattered nor feared any flesh. Because you know that Knox was a man who only feared God. Even said, I have never once feared the devil, but I tremble each time I ascend into the pulpit. Because he feared God. The seventh blessing is the God-fearer possesses eternal life. Verse 6b, the righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. Now this is where we distinguish between righteous acts and how one is called righteous. How can you and I, who are so unrighteous in our actions and in our heart and in our thoughts, be declared righteous? Friend, how can any man outside of Christ be considered this, the righteous? It'll never be because of the righteous deeds in verse 9. Because God says all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. Even your best deeds and mine too are polluted with sin and self. But where is our righteousness found? Verse 7, he trusteth in the Lord. Meaning, boys and girls, his faith is in the Lord. And that alone is how one is declared righteous. What the Bible calls the righteousness of God or the righteousness from God, which is by faith in Jesus. Romans 3, starting in 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by what? Faith of Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Here's the rub, right? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How are you justified? How are you called righteous? Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. A matter of the greatest praise. Yes, Jesus came from heaven above to fulfill the psalm and all the law that for you who believe his righteousness be credited to you as your own, that you might praise him as the Lord my righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. That all of your sins would be freely washed by his blood. That his goodness, his righteousness would be credited as your own. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Without Jesus, then, to survey a psalm like this would be a matter of despair, wouldn't it? It makes you say, how little I fear God. Yes, I might fear God, but how little I do. How short I fall of his glory. How few good things I do that I'm called to. But then, blessed thought it is, I look on Jesus and I trust on him as my standing before God, that God doesn't see my evil. Instead, he only sees the righteousness of Christ imputed to me and received by faith alone, that all my blessedness then is in Jesus. I remember what the Bible says, but of him ye are, are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us what? Wisdom. And where does the fear of God, what does it do? Wisdom begins there. It's made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, what? He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And that's where my glory is found, not my righteous deeds, not my fear of the Lord, but my glory is found in the Lord, my righteousness. And that is what you need, unbeliever. You need to be in Christ. Without him, you are counted as the wicked. Outside of Christ, what did Romans 3 tell us? There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no what? Fear of God in their eyes. Yes, all men have broken all the commandments of God. They have lied, they have stolen, they have hated, they have lusted. And all of that is enough to condemn us. And there's more. But especially that in view of all of their wickedness, there is no fear of God in their eyes. You need to fear God. You need to fear his wrath on sinners. And after fearing God, where do you go? 
you flee to Jesus for refuge, that he would save you from all of your sins. You believe on him. We had an interview for communion this morning and the man said, and we asked what his hope was. And he said, it was simply that he cast himself on Jesus, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. That's the only place that we can have help and hope. The eighth and final blessing is the exaltation of the God-fearer. Verse 9b, his horn shall be exalted with honor. Now this, again, applies to Jesus first and foremost, Hebrews 2.8. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that is in his humiliation, crowned with glory and honor. But you, believer, united to Christ by faith, shall be exalted as well. Lifted up, seated at the heavenly places, made priests and kings unto God. The believer has a grand and extraordinary future that lies ahead of them. Today, though, you and I follow in the steps of Christ's humiliation. Humbled, we are called to carry our cross. But in the life to come, as we suffer in this life, as Jesus was exalted, we will be too. Second Timothy 2.12 says, if we suffer we shall also what with him? Reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Remember that truth to persevere, you that fear God. Well, with that, as a survey of the eight blessings, we find that the God-fearer will receive. What you who have faith then, have you not seen that what you receive is far better than what hashtag blessed reveals online? You receive things immeasurably more glorious if yours is the fear of God. And so find these things the purpose and manner of praise. But as a counterpoint, let's close with the unbeliever's eternal misery. I'll be a bit more brief here. Verse 10, the wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. What you have here, right, is a contrast a contrast between the blessings of fearing God and the, the, the reality of what will it be to those who do not fear God in this life. And even in this world, right, so often it is the case that the wicked will see the righteous and the exaltation of the righteous and their blessings and be grieved. You remember Haman, right? He got to see Mordecai exalted and he grieved and was sorrowful for it. But this will certainly be the case in the world to come, believer, right? You remember the man, the rich man, and Lazarus from hell. The rich man saw Lazarus, and one of his torments is going to be Lazarus enjoying heaven. The man that was so greatly humiliated, right, begging for scraps from the rich man's table. Dogs coming to lick his sores. Now he sees, right, uh, the, the flip and the reverse. The wicked see it and shall be grieved. And hell, as we think on that text, is the eternal home of the wicked, isn't it? It's a place of grief, eternal grief, a gnashing of teeth. And I don't need to scare you in any way through that because this is the Bible that teaches it. And this is a reality then. As it comes to us in the word of God, it's an awful place. Our Savior himself said in Matthew 22, Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness, that is hell. There shall be weeping and what? Gnashing of teeth. The gnashing of teeth in the Bible signifies a kind of torment. The torment of sorrow and even anger. Perhaps something like this, it signifies the, the worst kind of despondency or depression and boiling anger, all melting and mixing together. And you know that even in this life, right, when someone grinds their teeth, it is to us like nails on a chalkboard, even if we're not the ones grinding our teeth. It's just about the least pleasant thing in the world. Well, every time that that happens, see that as a glimpse of the eternal destiny of those without Christ, they're just, it is a just reward. It is a just reward for their sins. It's a terrible thought, but it's a just and righteous thought. A thought that ought to make you and me flee to Jesus, that our wickedness be forgiven. 
Our psalm says that the desire of the wicked, their lust, will perish. And in this, all that the wicked live for in this life will never pan out. They will all die. Even before death, a lot of them are disappointed, aren't they? But certainly at death, they will be disappointed. Their beauty, their wealth, their industry, they will ask, what did it all matter in the end? You think of Steve Jobs created the most powerful company on the earth, dies of pancreatic cancer at 56 years of age. He rejected Christ, as far as anyone knows. But I was always fascinated to know that he went to a Lutheran church with his family when he was young. And he rejected Christ. And you think of that church, and I don't know anything of it, but you think of how many souls have worshipped God in that place, that are unknown to us today, unlike Steve Jobs, but were known to God, who went to church with that man, and these are now in glory. While that captain of industry who had all that the world had to offer, and unless the Lord gave him faith at the deathbed, now weeps and gnashes his teeth in hell, seeing them, these unknowns, in heaven. And all that he labored for, and all that he had pride in, all of that melted away and is of no use for eternity. The Lord Jesus would ask, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? soul?" And you see here that the wicked just melt away. Their end comes without fanfare. Oh, maybe there will be a, a celebration by the world for a day or two or maybe a year or so. But where are all the great men in your mind today? from all of history, they just fade off of life's stage as Steve Jobs did. What a contrast it is to the horn of the righteous that will be exalted. And the righteous will marvel at this too and praise the Lord forever, not only because he is just in condemning the wicked, but that also we, we deserve what they receive. And we have received mercy freely, not of our own doing, but by the love and mercy of God to put Christ in our heart. That Christ was condemned in our place. He bore what they bear for eternity. He bore it for us on the cross, condemned as wicked in our place. And we will marvel and praise Because the righteous man, we're astonished that the one righteous man of the psalm was condemned as one of the wicked in our stead. In our stead, we who are like Haman or Steve Jobs. And we will marvel and we will praise that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You will pray, do you think, beloved, that you will grow tired of praising God for that for all eternity? I hope you see this is a thing of marvel. For all eternity, as you think on the damnation of the wicked, you will have gratitude. I was a wicked man or a wicked woman like them, and I have received mercy instead. It baffles me. There is nothing good in me that deserves any of this, and I must praise God. Well, time is far gone, so let us end our meditation on that thought. And as you sing this psalm, remember the blessedness of the God-fearing man or woman. And so may it be for you and me that both the fear of the Lord and the praise of the Lord would grow in our lives. Amen. If able, please, please rise for prayer.